I'm wondering how deep can I go today? Somebody said, do what you got to do. That's right. <laughs> oh, we have been talking about transformative sacrifices for this month. And I thought it would be a wonderful uh, for us to continue uh, the conversation that we were having just a little bit on last week. If you guys put my PowerPoint up. And uh, I, I want to make sure that we are, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, that we are understanding the principles and the premises behind sacrifice. Everybody say sacrifice. sacrifice. Now, sacrifice becomes very important because it does afford us the opportunity to, to uh, take me to my slide that says closeness. Um, it does afford us the opportunity to be able to talk about something that oftentimes we don't talk about in the church. Uh, but, but as we are talking about it in the church, it does uh, calls for us to draw closer to God. Anytime when we're talking about sacrifice, we're not talking about just you giving something just for the sake of you giving something. We're talking about an entity, an act, a behavior that really draws you closer to God. It is our responsibility as a church, as a ministry, as a pastor, to be able to draw you closer to God. If I can get you to God, I have done my job. That's my job, my job. My job is not to bring you to man. My job is not to bring you to a program. My job is not to bring you even to a ministry. My job is to bring you to God. And after you leave the presence of God, then you will have a ministry. Okay, the Bible says that Paul wrote that, that he has given to us this ministry of reconciliation. That ministry of reconciliation is not just to be reconciled with one another. That ministry of reconciliation starts with being reconciled with God. That I cannot be reconciled with you if I'm not properly reconciled with God. My relationship with God will determine how well I will be connected to you and with you. Because everybody under the sound of my voice has human frailties and human issues. And everybody under the sound of my voice has got an issue and an idiosyncrasy and an insecurity and a problem and a phobia and a faux pas and all of the other things. <laughs> right? All right. So the only way that I can truly be reconciled with you long term is that I understand God and that I am drawn to God because I've got to get so close to God that God is the only thing that I see in you. <laughs> How about that? All right. So now if you ever find yourself in a place in which you are seeing the ugliness in people. More so than you are seeing the God in the moment and in the people, it means that you need to draw close to God. Right? Y'all still with me? All right, stay with me. It's going to be tight, but it's going to be right. And we're going to, I want you to introduce, if you don't know each other around, around your, your, your area, your little community, I want you to introduce yourself because we're going to dive into the word together today. Yeah, before I start studying it, we all going to study it together. <laughs> and we're going to get some revelation. And so today I want to talk about closeness. Just take me to my next one. There we go. All right. So let me recap this just for a second. Let me recap this. On this past Sunday, remember I was talking about uh, life echoes, right? I was talking about how what God speaks in eternity echoes in time. That you're living in an echo. Right. That there is something that is very powerful about the Bible that because you study it and you know it, you understand certain things that are foreshadowings and pre-shadowings of things that are to come. The only problem with us is that it's not that God is not doing the same thing and doing it the same way that he did it in biblical days. It's just that we haven't discerned these pre-shadowing and, pre, uh, and, and foreshadowing uh, moments in our lives. That you're not going to go into a place or go into something that God has not ordained for you to go into. 
that purpose and destiny is something that has been ordained by God for you to walk into. Which means that when you walk into your promise and you walk into your purpose and you walk into your destiny, the only reason why you need to fight is that there has been a devil that has been camped out on something that belongs to you. The reason why they were camped out on something that belongs to you is because they've been taking care of it until you grow up. It's not that you can't defeat them, and it's not that when you see the devil, you should run the other way. In fact, when you see him, you should run straight into him because if it is your promise and if it is yours, he's got to flee. Oh, y'all don't hear me. He's got to flee. A thousand shall fall on your left hand, 10,000 shall fall on your right. It shall not come now your dwelling. They will come in one way, they will flee in five other ways. There, 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 will be, there will be a dispersion of the enemy off your stuff when you start pursuing it. So it's the trick of the enemy to get you distracted and detoured from your destiny. <laughs> Because that's the thing and the spot that he would like to occupy. So when we were talking about Isaac and echoing and looking at Isaac as his life being an echoing life, uh, we talked about that faith is the ability to obey God without uh, truly or fully knowing what the outcomes will be. That God wanted to test Abraham, Genesis, the 22nd chapter, and he wanted to test him and he said, I'm going to test you to see whether or not you're going to do what I'm asking for you to do. I'm going to ask for you to do a hard thing. I'm going to ask for you to give up your only son, the son whom you love, Isaac. He's very specific in the sacrifice that he wants. <laughs> Which means that when God is requiring a sacrifice from you, he's very specific in the kind of sacrifice that he wants. He pinpoints the sacrifice that he wants. He even puts a name on it. Give me this. He says, I want you to bring uh, your son Isaac to me because remember Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. And so that there is no question as to which one you'll sacrifice because if God does not tell Abraham which one he's going to sacrifice and he needs to sacrifice, then Abraham, watch, will give the sacrifice to God, the one that he does not prefer. Uh, he's, in other words, he will keep Isaac because that's his only one. That's the child that's born through a miracle. So you keep the miracle, but I'm going to give you the one that was born through a maid servant. Uh, and God says, no, I don't want you to give me what you want me to have. I want you to give me the one that came through a miracle. <laughs> the one that's more, most precious to you. And this is the test. Everybody say, this is the test. Anytime when you have a test, the first thing that you got to understand is that who is going to participate in this test? Because there are going to be more participants in your test besides you. <laughs> God is not going to test you by yourself. <laughs> because other people are going to be impacted by the decisions that you make. All right. So when I say that life echoes, whatever you do in life echoes throughout eternity, whatever God speaks in eternity echoes in life so that whatever you do is going to impact the next generation. Right. So then God tells Abraham, bring your son Isaac. So Isaac is a part of this test. Isaac is a part of this test, but Isaac is not spoken to by God about a test that's going to impact his life that he is going to have to submit to. Okay. So either you're the one being tested directly or you're the one that's indirectly being tested by your ability to submit to the process. <laughs> so either way, you don't understand or know your outcomes. And this is the reason why we need faith. Y'all got that? All right, I'm, I'm going to move on. So your faith then uh, to live is a lifestyle of sacrifice echoes into other generations. All right. I'll show you how. Isaac was born to a woman miraculously and so was Jesus. Echo, echo, echo. It happened before. It happens again. It is believed that Isaac was 33 years old at the time of him being sacrificed. If he is 33 years old at the time that he is being sacrificed, then it echoes in Jesus' life that he would be 33 when he is sacrificed. The only difference is Jesus went through with it. 
It's an echo, right? And and uh, uh, as it pertains to as it pertains to uh, these these these. This death, Isaac's death on Mount Moriah, uh, was to serve as a prophetic sample for the Messianic death. In other words, it was believed that Jesus actually was supposed to die in the temple. (laughs) If the people would have accepted him as the king and their Messiah, if they would have understood a prophecy and understood what the, the, the significance of this, he was, the thought was that he would then have died uh, uh, in the temple, but he died on the mount because Moriah was not just one mountain. Moriah was a mountain range. Oh, God. So even though Jesus didn't die on the same spot, he was in the same range. And the echo is always within range. Okay, so so when God calls you to a spot, I want you to hear me. I didn't say this on Sunday, but this is just worth of your this is just worthy of your coming. When God calls you to a place and he says that there is something that he has for you, there is a range of spots, places and opportunities in which that door may open. Oh, God. Look at somebody say, God is going to bless you with a range of ideas. Oh, somebody's going to get it in just a moment. A range of opportunities. How many of you have ever come into a season of your life in which opportunities just keep on coming from it? It's just not one. It's just a range of them. Right. That's the kind of God you serve. That's the kind of God we serve. All right. So so your willingness then to sacrifice your life is your initiation into your prophetic destiny. You will never get to your destiny without sacrificing your life. Jesus said it like this, that in order for you to gain your life, to find your life, you must first lose it. If you cannot lose your life, you'll never be able to find the life destiny that God has in store for you. So anytime when God asks for you to sacrifice your life, it is so that you can find the life that he has already preordained for you to have. When Isaac is asked, if y'all, if, how, many, how many Greeks, fraternity, uh, you're in fr- really? I don't know. Oh, yeah, it's just fine. All right, so now, so now you heard of this thing called initiation. How many of y'all have, have, have ever uh, been a part of a gym? Right? You know, they, they have an initiation fee. How many of you have ever paid an initiation fee? What is the initiation fee for? Right that you will not become a part of this until it costs you something. (laughs) Isaac has got to pay to be a part of the prophetic promise that God gave to Abraham. Through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. How's that going to happen? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a seed. I'm going to give you a son. Okay, great. I'm gonna give, I gave you the son. I prophesied to you that you're going to have the son, but he is going to have to pay to be a part of this prophecy. Oh, God. Who? Oh, God. That means that you don't get to your prophetic destiny without giving your life. And so Isaac has to give his life to it. Every, every other generation after that will have hands laid on them. Isaac never gets his hands laid on him because this is the laying on of a hand. This is when he gave his life for it. It was his initiation. All right? So now, if you're going to, listen, if you're going to operate in your prophetic destiny, you're going to have to lay your life down. (laughs) Okay, I know I'm messing with your flesh. I'm going to keep on messing with it. (laughs) All right, so now Abraham had past the the greatest test of faith that a person can face at this place and God made it holy ground. Isaac was to die on an altar at the very same place where Jesus would die on the altar. Watch. So your prophetic destiny then means that others will benefit from your sacrifice. So you're not just laying down your life to find your life. You're laying down your life so that the next generation can find their life too. <laughs> if you, okay, all right, put it like this. If Mary doesn't say yes, then we don't benefit from it. Okay, somebody, so if Mary doesn't say yes, 
We don't benefit from it. If Joseph doesn't say, I will stick around and take care of somebody else's child, then we don't benefit from it. We benefit from it because people said yes. This is the hall of faith in the book of Hebrews, the, the 11th chapter. All of those people had faith. In chapter 12, it says, and this is the reason why we have a cloud of witnesses, because the cloud is saying, I, listen, I said yes to something. Not so that you can sit there and soak about what God didn't do for you, but you can get up off your blessed assurance and say yes to God the way I said yes, so you can see the same miracles operate in your life. What happens if I told you that there is a promise sitting on a shelf waiting on your generation to say yes? Okay, so now this is the principle and the premise. I'll, I'll, deal, I'll deal with this text on, on Sunday, hint, hint, 2 Samuel 24, where David, where David actually purchases <laughs> the threshing floor that happened to be in the same range. I'll deal with that on Sunday. Show up on Sunday. We'll go a little deeper. Now, here's your question. And everybody's going to be a part of this, and I'm going to give you six minutes to deal with this. One minute to read it. <laughs> Another minute for you to kind of dissect what you just read. And then the next four minutes for you to discuss it. Here it is. So what can separate us from the love of God? Because remember I told you that the reason why we have sacrifice is so that we can draw close. If we're not able to draw close, that means that something is separating us from God. What can separate us from the love of God? Right? Second question is, what can separate God from our love? The first question is about God's love towards us. Is there anything that can stop God from loving us? The second question is our love towards God. Is there anything that can stop us from loving God? <laughs> yep, all right. Six minutes, here we go. Ready? And I want you to read the text, Exodus, the 19th chapter, verses 8 through 25, and read chapter 20, verses uh, 18 through 26. Ready, set, go. Exodus 19. Exodus 20. Check it out, and then... Discuss those two questions. Four minutes, you should start discussing right now. Or three minutes and 43 seconds. Come on, start discussing. So what can separate us from the love of God? What can separate God from our love?
Two minutes and 30 seconds. All right, five, four, three, two, and one. All right. <laughs> so you're all like, is this a trick question? Yes, it is, uh, to a certain degree. All right, so, so the first question is about what can separate God's love from us? What causes for him to say, I don't love you anymore? Come on, who's, who's, Bible readers? Is there anything? Yeah, the Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God. There you go, all right? Bible answers that. It's very clear, right? My question to you then, the second one is, then what can stop us? from loving God. According to the text, what causes for there to be separation? Disobedience? Sin, unrepentance? Unbelief, idolatry? Lack of honor? Pride? Rebellion? Unforgiveness? Loss? Three, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Yep, yep. All right. I, okay, so now, so now let's all dive into it. I'm going to read it with you this time and see if I can bring out some more stuff. All right, look, look at Exodus, the 19th chapter. The 19th chapter, verses 18 through 25. Look at this. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And it's his smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. God is coming down. God is coming down to meet with men. Now, if, it's, if sin separates God from us, then God wouldn't come down. Mind you, it was God that was walking in, in the garden at the cool of the day, even after Adam and Eve had sinned. So even though Adam and Eve were still hiding from God, God was still looking and searching. All right. Verse 19, when the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with a thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. He says, I'm going to come down only so far. Oh, God, get this. I'm going to only come down so far. I'm going to call you up, too. 
So <laughs> I'm going to come down only so far. I'm going to call you up. I'm not going to call you as high as I am. I'm going to call you as high as you can get. I will come down and make up the difference. All right, I want you to see this. I want you to see this there. 20, then the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top and Mount, uh, Moses went up. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down, warn the people so that they do not break through to the Lord to gaze and many of them perish. He says, go down. Now that you've been in my presence, now I want you to go down. And I want you to talk to the people, make sure that they don't gaze and look intently into me. Why? Because if they look intently into me, they're going to die. Okay, verse 22, and also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves or else the Lord will break out against them. In other words, just because you are working for me as a priest, it don't mean that you are sinless too. <laughs> Wait a minute. Do you mean everybody has got to be consecrated? Yes. Both the people and the priests have got to be consecrated. See, in church, we just taught you that only the priests needed to be consecrated. Only preachers needed to be consecrated. No, not just preachers, but everybody else who says that they are, are Christians need to be consecrated too. Okay, 23, Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, go down and come up again, and you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break forth upon them. So Moses went down to the people and told them, now watch this. I want you to see, if you can see this with your mind's eye, it will really set the precedence of what it means to be a leader and what it is for you to stand in the gap between people and God. Look at the work that Moses has got to do. He's got to go up, speak to God. God says, now go down and tell, talk to the people. He's got to go back down and talk to the people, and then he's got to come back up and speak to God. And then he's got to go back down and talk to... We're not talking about a walk around the corner. We're talking about up a mountain. <laughs> up a mountain. We're talking about, we're talking about <laughs> more, at, at least, at least five miles up. <laughs> come on, come on. Watch, watch. I, I was about to get there, but you, you made me go down. I'll, I'll go there now then. Watch. And God didn't say, you know what? This is too much for you because you're too old. He requires movement from you no matter the age. Right? So now look at this exercise that he's got to do up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And then when he comes back down, he gives the people the Ten Commandments. Right? Now flip over to chapter 20. Flip over to chapter 20. Go all the way down to verse 18. Look at this. This is powerful. Look at this. All the people perceive the thunder and the lightning, flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and they stood at a distance. It's not that they could not come close to God. It's just that God had created boundaries so that they won't extend the boundary lest they die. And he did not tell them that you cannot get close to me because I don't love you. He says, I, I put a boundary there because I love you. Somebody gonna get it. In other words, the boundary is an extension of my love. The reason why I put the boundary there is that, is that if you come too close, you're gonna die too soon and I need for you to live. I love you so much that I won't kill you with my presence. And so I'll put a boundary there and cause for you to come as close as you can come and I will get as close as I need to get so that you can really sense my presence and know that I'm there. Watch this, watch this now, watch this, watch this. Verse Verse 19, then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will do what? Die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come in order to test you. And in order that the fear of him, watch, may remain in you. 
You ever heard of the fear of God in you? Or put the fear of God in you? Why, why, why does he need that? So that you may not sin. See, the reason why people are able to sin so freely is because they're really not as close to God as they can get or as they should be. Because when you really get close to God, there is a reverential fear that comes upon you because you understand that even though I may not be in your physical presence, your eyes are always on me and I'm going to have to give an account for everything that I did in public and in private. I want you to think about it from this vantage, from this perspective, that the people did not draw close and did not want to draw close because they were afraid. 21, so the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You shall not make other gods besides me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves, watch, verse 24, you shall make an altar of earth for me, and you shall do what? Sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. I will come to you and bless you. Now watch this. He says that everywhere... I cause my name to be remembered. Make an altar and make a sacrifice. <laughs> Everywhere that I cause for my name to re be remembered, make an altar, make a sacrifice. Uh, so now, here it is. God has a way of taking you to certain experiences. The reason why he takes you through certain experiences is so, it's not so much that you did anything. It is because what he is trying to reveal to you about him. Oh God. So you will never know him as a provider if he does not create some kind of lack. <laughs> Are you hearing me today? So now, so now he creates scenarios so his name can be remembered. Oh God. oh, God. He says, and when I flex my muscle, when I show you who I am, stop giving praise and glory to everything else. Make an altar, make a sacrifice right there so that everybody will know it was my God that did this. Now, I'm about to bless you, right? Because God... God is, is so God that he says, watch, I'm going to bless you before you sacrifice. Oh, God. Oh, God, okay. He says, I'm going to bless you before you sacrifice. But if I bless you, don't leave this blessing without giving me. Oh, God, see, see, so, <laughs> see, see. What we do is we like to trap God, like, like, God, you should do this for me. And then we walk away and we give him no sacrifice, nothing. God is so God, he says, I'm going to bless you before you give me a sacrifice. My question to you is, has God shown himself today? Do you remember? Oh, all right, all right, all right. Do you remember where God flexed his muscle today? Have you given him a sacrifice yet? Oh, God. <laughs> Some of y'all just drove here. You didn't say thank you at all. Some of y'all ate today, didn't even say thank you for the food I'm about to receive. Some of you got up with the health in your body, didn't say thank you at all. So you even came into the house of the Lord. And when it was time to say thank you, you didn't even say thank you. I'm telling you something that is going to bless your soul right now to bring you into remembrance of who he is. And you still won't say thank you. Which is the reason why God says, I'm going to shrivel up my hand and stop blessing you. Because every time I did bless you, you didn't even say thank you. 
Let's try it. I'm going to give you 20 seconds. Can you give glory and praise? Can you open up your mouth and just tell them thank you? Come on, come on, come on, come on. It's a sacrifice of praise. Come on, it's a sacrifice of praise. It's a sacrifice. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, 10 more seconds. Come on, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Ah! Come on, even the children are raising their hands. Come on, you better lift your hands. Hallelujah. Woo! Amen. You can have your seats. Now watch, watch, watch. I got 15 minutes. I need to land this. Okay, watch. Verse 25. He says, if you make an altar of stone for me, you should not build it of cut stones, for if you wield your tool on it, you will profane it. You should go up by the steps to my altar so that your nakedness will not be exposed on it. Let me talk about those two principles here. Very powerful principles. He said that when you are making the altar, don't put an implement uh -huh. to try and cut it. Uh -huh. Because if you try to cut it, you will use your imagination. Yep. 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 And I can't trust your imagination because you got too many idols in your imagination. Yes. And you'll try to cut it in the image that is in your... Yes. He said, don't, so don't touch it. Leave it naturally, like it is. <laughs> and then he said that if you do go up, make sure that you don't go up in front of the people. Because he's not saying so that your nakedness won't be exposed to God. Your nakedness is always exposed to God. God don't care anything about your nakedness. He always sees it. He says that the, the way that I want you to go up, priest, is to go up in such a way that your nakedness is not exposed to the people. So you're not called to be as transparent yes. <laughs> as people do. <laughs> Certain things just should not be. <laughs> right? Because you are the priest. Now, the reason why this is, is because if people start seeing your nakedness, then they'll never be able to perceive you as their priest. So, so God says, I need to protect the office that you hold by covering you. I'm not denying that you got issues. I'm just covering your issues. Because even the people can see you that you're sacrificing for yourself too, which means that you got to sin too. <laughs> oh God, I'm just making sure that the people can still perceive you as one that can represent me to you. So, so, so here's the principle. Then can anything separate us from the love of God? Answer is no. But then what can separate God from our love? And that's what I, I want to, to kind of help us out. Here are principles. The principle of separation. God's desire is always to be near us or close to us. That's his desire. Just to be close to you is my desire. Man sings that, but that's God's song. Just to be close to you. Oh, oh I, I can't, I can't, I can't. Ooh. Sorry. It'll take me somewhere else. I won't finish. Right. So <laughs> fear then disguises itself as an excusable feeling that separates itself from God. The reason why the people did not want to get close to God is because they were afraid. Yeah. Remember what Adam said. Who God said, who told you you were naked? He said, he said, I was afraid, therefore I hid. The reason why people don't get close to God is because they are afraid. 
You are afraid that you're going to have to let go of the thing that God is trying to kill. The very thing that he wants you to sacrifice is the reason why you don't want to get close to him. Because we all know deep down inside in our hearts that this very thing is keeping us from getting as close to God as we need to get. Come on, y'all still with me? All right, so now, so now watch this. So, so man's goat, man's goal is to strive to come as close to God as one possibly can. And so the idea of offerings, teachings, uh, teaches us to take the physical, the body, and sanctify it. The body. Sanctify it. This is what James says in 4 and 8. Come near to God and he will... Remember I showed you, God came down, Moses came up. God came down, Moses came right? So, so wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your what? You what? In other words, the reason why we can't get close to God is because we got two lovers. We love God, but we love our stuff. We love God, but we love, and, 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 and we don't want the two to meet until the one is about to destroy us. Then we want God to come in. <laughs> See, y'all laughing because y'all know it's true, right? Right? And, and this is a powerful principle. So the separation occurs because of our flesh. Is there anything that can cause for us to stop loving God? Yes, our flesh. Let me show you how. Let me show you how. So now, the flesh factor of a sacrifice in Galatians 5 and 24, it says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its what? All right, so now there are two things that's going to keep you from loving God. Your passion and your desire that comes from your flesh. Let me say it again. Your passion and your desire that comes from your flesh. In fact, let me prophetically tell you right now that when the Bible talks about the great apostasy, which is the great falling away, that in the last days, last and evil days, there's going to be a falling away from God. It is going to become because of people's passions and desires that they didn't crucify that was a part of their flesh. Okay, all right, so now, so now, to, to, to crucify then is literally, literally used of, of the Romans crucifying Christ on a wooden cross, but the, but the idea figuratively of pulling the old self to death, putting the old self to death by submitting all decisions, somebody say all decisions, to the Lord, which means <laughs> it's a passion of yours. My question is, is it a passion of God's? <laughs> you want to do it. Question is, does God want you to do it? Now, we know what you don't want God to touch by what you don't pray for. I need a real church up in here. Don't you look at me. Y'all know, you know. You know the very thing that you don't want God to touch is the very thing that you want your flesh to run around happy in. But if you ever, you know in your spirit, if you ever ask God, is this your will? You know the answer is going to come back to you, no, which already tells you it's not his will. <laughs> All right, let me ask you, have you ever had anybody to ask you a question about something that they already know the answer to. Why are they asking you? Because they want affirmation. <laughs> and then when you don't give it to them, they get angry with you. Because they never wanted you to disagree with them. Oh God, I want you to hear this statement. I can't be in relationship with a God who will always agree with me. God, I need to be in relationship with a God that will say, I disagree with what it is that you're doing. What you're doing is I need to be checked in my flesh 
because there is no good thing in my flesh. My flesh has passions and desires that will totally take me out of the presence of God. And I need to kill everything that will hinder me from getting close to my God. Y'all still with me? All right, so now let's go just a little deeper. Here, here are the passions. So the passions is the capacity to, to, to foot strong emotion or to feel strong emotion like suffering. Properly, the capacity and the privilege of experiencing strong feeling, deep emotion, agony, passion, urgent desire, suffering. That's a passion. Here's your desire. Uh, uh, a passionate desire. Properly passion, but on strong feelings. In other words, when you make decisions based off of strong feelings versus strong wisdom, you are in your flesh. Okay, we can't. When, when you want to retaliate, oh God, when you want to retaliate, and somebody has did something to you or said something about you that you know it's like, oh my God, how could they? And then your flesh gets hurt by it. And the first thing that you want to do is retaliate. That's when God is saying, that's when I want to crucify your flesh. In fact, the reason why I allowed it to happen is to let you know what's not dead yet. Oh God, who did I just talk to in here today? You know what's not dead yet by the situations that God allows to come into your life. He's trying to expose your flesh. Because all those that be in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. All right. I got four minutes. Let me land it. So when I read Romans 8, he said, kill him, Lord, kill him. <laughs> when I read Romans 8, I read it differently now. Because before when I was reading it, I was reading it according to what can separate me from the love of God. Listen. What then shall we say to these things of God before us, who is against us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies, who is the one who condemns. Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will then separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death. How, how often? Oh. I, I, I see, I, I, you want to be like Christ? Here it is. <laughs> you are being put to death. You know, Jesus being put to death was a slow process. It just didn't, ha it, did, it ended at Calvary, but it started in the judgment hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> All day, he was being put to death. Oh, now watch this, watch this. For, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In, in other words, Jesus, God says, I love you so much, I gave you my son. I gave you my son as an eternal sacrifice, which means that my love is eternal because of my sacrifice. I love you forever because what I gave you lasts forever. Now, how much do you love me? What are you willing? <laughs> I gave you 
my only son, what are you willing to give me? In fact, what, what happens if I told you what I wanted? Instead of you giving me your Ishmael, I want to know, can I have your Isaac? I, I, I got, I'm going to end this. I got one minute to end this. Okay. Darn it. Now, that stuff that I underlined, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, it will not separate God's love from us. But I've dealt with people enough to know that it will stop people from loving God. So let's dive in to what those things are, things that will attack the flesh, that separate. Uh, tribulation, properly pressure, used at a narrow place that hems somebody in, especially internal pressure that comes somewhat to feel continued, restricted, without options. Have you ever been at a time in your life in which you felt like you didn't have any options? It is at that time in which people walked away from God. <laughs> God... You gave me so much pressure that I felt like I didn't have any options, so I walked away from you. Uh, you didn't give me a vote in this thing, and because you didn't give me a vote, I, I, I don't, I don't want to be around you. And it is the pressure and the tribulation of life that has caused for people to walk away from God. How about, how about distress? Narrow, confined, and space, territory, area, properly a narrow place, figuratively a difficult circumstance which God always authorized and hence only produces a temporal sense of uh, confinement. In other words, watch, you thought that the hell that you're going through right now was supposed to be your whole life, but it was only supposed to be temporary. God was testing to see whether or not you were still going to call out his name even when it's not convenient. But people walked away because of distress. People have walked away because of persecution. Properly pursuit, chase. Persecution, literally the fruit of being someone down uh, like an animal, uh, 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 trying to suppress or punish their convictions. In other words, watch. When, when persecution comes, somebody is expressing their conviction. That's all they're doing. They're expressing what convictions they have. But your convictions can be called to challenge my faith. Give us Barabbas. Their conviction said, give us Barabbas because Jesus was not the Messiah. But their conviction was wrong. God allowed for their convictions to kill them. And somebody's convictions are killing you right now. And here you are trying to fight the process. <laughs> oh, God. Who did I just talk to in here? Have you ever had somebody to come to you with a conviction that's just their conviction and they try to kill you with their conviction? Paul says it like this. Now, when I get around some of you, my Jewish brothers, y'all think that just because these Greek brothers have to eat meat that, that we should tell them, stop eating meat. Paul said it like this. He says, I'm not going to stop eating meat just because you don't want me to. That's your conviction. I just won't eat meat in your presence. Y'all don't hear me today. Okay, I'm trying to help you. Because religious people will put you in a box of their own convictions. Oh, God. I'm not convicted by what I am doing. That means that you're not my Holy Ghost. And if I don't get convicted... Then stop killing me because of your convictions. Religious church has been that for years. You got to wear long skirts. Well, who said that? Tell me in the Bible what that is an issue. No makeup, no movies, no nothing. And here you are killing people with your convictions. It's yours. You can't. But I'm going to see Wakanda forever. And I'll tell you how it is. Anyway. 
Somebody say famine. Famine is the place in which you fall short. It is a time in which God allows for you to go without. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Who did I just talk to? Everybody under the sound of my voice will have a moment in which God will allow for you to go without just to see how you're going to respond. Now, some people, because they've gone without, will steal, lie, and kill just to get something. Some of us choose to say, this is where my faith is challenged, and the Lord will provide. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know when he's going to do it, but I just know that the Lord will provide provide. Y'all don't hear me today. I know I don't have no groceries in the refrigerator, but it doesn't mean that there are no groceries in the atmosphere. God is able to minister to somebody that's got my surplus. And if I give him a sacrifice of praise, maybe my blessing will be able to find me. <laughs> oh God, I got to go. Woo! Oh, Everybody say nakedness. Wearing only the undergarment bare open manifest near generally being uncovered. God, why would you allow for me to be uncovered? What? Oh, I'll give you one. Here's, here's one coming. Jesus did not die on the cross with all his clothes on. Right, that's right, that's right. That's right. <laughs> In fact, his clothes, the soldiers were gambling for. All he had <laughs> was his body, bottoms and nakedness, uncovered. Sometimes, God allows for his people to be uncovered just so that the devil will know that just because they're uncovered, it, did, it doesn't mean that they're not protected. Okay. Ah! All right, let me give you another example. The Bible says the first time that Abraham made a sacrifice, he had to cut uh, turtle doves. And, and the Bible says that he cut them open where the bodies were split and there was blood in between and God came down and, and, and he, had to, he had to wait on God to come down. But, but, but while the dead bodies were there, buzzards were in the air trying to steal the sacrifice and he had to beat away the sacrifice. Y'all don't hear me today. Because just because the sacrifice was, was, was uncovered, it doesn't mean that it wasn't protected. And there's something about your sacrifice that God is saying, I'm beating away every devil that is trying to kill you because you put your life on the altar for me. Hey, God, who did I just talk to? He says, I'm beating away every demonic spirit that's been trying to kill you because you sacrificed your life. If you just lay it down, he says, I got you covered. He asked you to get naked just so that he could cover you. I got to stop. That's all the time we have for today. Is it 821? Is that the time? Yes. Okay, good. <sighs> Risk. I want you to hear me. I want, I, want, I want you guys to hear your pastor. Hear me. Every sacrifice that God will require for you to make is going to be a risk. It's a risk. God, if I preach this, what happens if they don't listen? Doesn't matter. Don't be afraid of their faces. Well, if I... If I say what they don't want me to say, Lord, they're going to put me in a cistern. They're going to throw me away. And they, don't matter. People didn't call you. I called you. 
if I tell them the truth, they may not want to be my friend after I tell them the truth. It doesn't matter because I'm your friend. And if they can't be your friend after truth, then they were really your friend after a lie. And you don't want no relationship that's built on a lie anyway. I'm trying to expose who and what is supposed to be in your life. So live in truth. It's a risk, Lord. It's a risk. They're not going to like me. But you're going to have to get over your flesh. Wanting to be liked by everybody. Okay. All right. All right. All right. See, see, this is for, for another generation. This is the heart. This is the hard part about another generation, because because if you if you if you're on social media, you live by likes and follows. <laughs> but what happens if you don't get all the likes <laughs> and what happens if nobody follows it? Because just because they are following you or liking you, it doesn't mean that you're living in truth. Some people like a lie more than they like the truth. Some people will follow a lie more than they'll follow truth. A risk. Everybody say, I got to be willing to take a risk. Every time God required me, required of me to give something, either my, my time or, or an offering, it was a risk. In the back of my head, I was always saying, now, now, now what if this don't work? But I can't control the outcomes. And that's the reason why I need faith. Last one. So, somebody say sword. So it properly a slaughter knife, a short sword or a dagger, mainly used for stabbing, an instrument for exacting retribution. What happened if I told you that Jesus went through all of it on Calvary? What happened if I told you, what happened if I told you that he went through tribulation because he was whipped on his back. So, so, so what happens if I told you that he was in distress because there was no answer for his pain? What happened if I told you that he went through persecution, beard pulled from his face, people hurling insults at him? What happens if I told you that he went through lack, I thirst? What happened if I told you that he went through, he went through nakedness, that he was on the cross with somebody else gambling for his clothes? What happened if I told you that he went through peril? He took a risk. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. What happened if I told you that he went through sword to see whether or not he was dead? They pierced him in the side. What happened if I told you that Jesus went through all of it for you just to get close to you and you won't go through one of it for him? This, I'll get to this the next time because the attack of the flesh is one, but the attack of the spirit is the other. Principalities and powers of spiritual wickedness in high places. That's an attack too. I'll deal with that the next one. I, I want to tell you though that the whole idea behind the sacrifice is to get close to God and I can't get close to him if I'm not willing to sacrifice something. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm. If I want him to be able to speak to me, am I willing to sacrifice my time? Am I willing to turn off the TV and flip over my phone and turn it off so I won't even hear the ding, ding? Because some of us, we've been praying with the ding, ding. Lord, in the name of Jesus, ding. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Even now, God. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, Lord, Father. Yes. Oh, my God. Oh, yes. Oh, Lord. Ooh. Oh, Lord, yes, yes. <laughs> Whatever you love, you will make time for. I am trying to get us close to God. And that should not start at the church. 
It should start in your own tent. Your own home. Your own place of abode. When we have family prayer, everything has got to stop. Even the dog stops. I can't understand a word that my humans are saying. But it looks deep. I better stop. Everything has got to stop. I, I, I'll, stop, I'll stop here and I'll, I'll give you this story. Oh, I, was, I was away at school. I was 18 years old. And I'm away at school. And I was praying to God. I said, God, show yourself to me. I said, I want you to, I want you to give me like a sign and a wonder. Let thunder come in my room. I want, I want it all. I, I had just read this text, the whole Exodus thing. I want thunder. Let your voice thunder. I want to thunder. Yeah. And I prayed and I fasted. I knew my roommate wasn't going to be back anyway because he, he went from one party to the next. And you know, on college campuses, it's always parties until the sun comes up, especially on the weekends. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's what I heard. Woo! Wasn't always like I'm sacrificing. I turn up the Bible. Oh, Pat, let's kick it. Okay, Lord, I'll come back to you in just a moment. Get up. <laughs> and nothing happened. Nothing happened. And I said, Lord, what? Why didn't you show yourself? I mean, I'm sacrificing. I'm, and he said this. He said, I don't want to sacrifice for a moment. I want a lifetime. And he said, if you make a lifetime sacrifice to me, I'll make a lifetime manifestation to you. Whew. I'll show myself. From moment to moment, from context to context, I'll show myself. And when I gave him my life, it hurt. I didn't want to, but it was a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. It is my reasonable act of worship that I give him me. Take my will. Control it. Take my mind. Transform it. To yours, God. You desire holiness in my inward parts. And I want to be. These are my struggles. I'm giving them to you because I want you to touch them. I can't get this thing out of my life if you don't touch it. I want you to touch it. That's why I'm praying for I'm praying. I'm asking you to touch it because I can't get this out of my flesh. There is nothing good in my flesh. I'm trying to get it out and I can't get it out. I need for you to touch it, God. And if you don't touch it, I'm going to mess stuff up. I'm going to mess up my family. I'm going to mess up the church. I'm going to mess up people. I'm going to mess up relationships. I'm going to mess up my money. If you don't get this thing, if you don't, if you don't touch it, I need you to touch it. And for many of you, you haven't even prayed that prayer yet. But if you start praying that prayer, God, I want you to touch the thing that I can't deal with because my flesh, my flesh can't even deal with this. But, but I'm, I'm giving it to you. I'm, I'm, I'm exposing it to you because you already know. You already know. You already know. That's when God says, all right, now I'm about to draw close to you. Because you're willing to draw close to me. Everyone sit on your feet. Mm -hmm. Just for a minute. Come on. Come on, take, just take a few moments. We're about to get out just right now. Just slip your hands up before the Father. Ask the Lord to come into the areas and the places and spaces of your life that 
I know it's going to be a risk that you give it to him, but come on, come on, just open up your mouth and just say, Lord, I want you to touch this area, whatever that is. Come on, open up your mouth all over the place. That's right. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. You may be watching and streaming on live. Come on. There's a place in the area of your life that God needs to touch. Come on, allow for him to touch it. Allow for him to touch it. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, God, oh, God. It's our responsibility to bring you closer to God. It's our responsibility to bring you close to your Savior, to bring you close to your Lord. Oh, God, we just honor you, Father. There are areas of our lives in which we need for you to touch. Touch our relationships, oh, God. Make them holy, oh, God. Touch our thoughts and our mindsets, oh, God. Make them holy, oh, God. Touch our, our behavior, Father, and the things that we even touch, oh, God. Make them holy, oh, God. Calls for our decisions to be holy, oh, God. We lift them up to you. Holiness. 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 It's what I love for. Holiness is what I need. 